All right. In this video, I want to talk about life. And this actually has to do with the Christian commission to go out into the world and preach the gospel. Now, I have this picture here because it depicts going out into the world, right? You see a city here. You don't see a jungle or a wooded area, a desert. You're going out where the people are. And we see a connection with life and light, like we read in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, how Jesus, the Word of God, is life, and that life was the light of men, and that that was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And what is interesting about that is at conception, where the sperm meets the egg, there's actually a flash of light. And that's when the actual forming of the child happens. Now, I wanted to use this depiction here to show a few things. The main thing is these scribblings that I put off to the side here. You may see what I'm, I'm showing outside of that, but the scribblings you might not understand. So what we actually have here is the egg within the womb and some of the sperm coming to the egg, but the rest of this is the rest of the sperm. And that is basically how it is in the world, right? Because what we see here, I made a little Y here as a depiction of the uterus and it's kind of like a cross right or like jesus hanging up on the cross and that is where the egg is and jesus says no one can come onto me unless my father draw him and he says when he is lifted up he will draw all men to him and what is interesting is that women draw men right? So anyway, uh, I was learning something interesting that just uh, was discovered. I don't know if it was discovered in the last three years or within the last year or so, but they were just starting to publish it about how the egg actually releases something. I don't know if it's some kind of pheromone, chemical, or what have you that actually repels certain sperm and attracts others and this is exactly what we get from god he draws us to the cross and others it repels because when you come to the cross it humbles you where you realize your condition that not only are you a sinner in the sense that you have sinned and your sin needs to be paid for Right? Your selfishness, your pride, your arrogance, your self-righteousness, your hypocrisy and contradictions and delusions and all this, right? But you are also a sinner in the sense that you're corrupted. You're corrupted and you ha are powerless to change yourself. You may be able to contain yourself in the sense that within you, you want to continue to do what you're doing. You enjoy going against God and you enjoy sinning. We all do. So you might be able to contain that and hold it back so that you're not actually doing the things that you want to do, but you can't change yourself where you don't desire that anymore. That's why we need to be born again. As Jesus says, you can't enter into the kingdom. You can't even see it unless you are born again. And that's what this is a depiction of. We see the first birth, and that helps us understand second birth but while talking about this what i want to actually talk about is the ones that are repelled because see these are the ones that lack humility and all the people that fall off at the wayside right the way to life is narrow just this single little egg 
but the way to destruction is broad and many be on it. And you see, all these sperm that end up going off to the side and just dying, perishing, they actually think they're going for the egg. They're going for life, but they're not. So there's so many metaphors to be used here, such as this is the word of God, seed, and this is the pure word, the truth, unadulterated, not politically correct, unapologetic, word of God right here. And the, on the sides there would be corrupted word, the word missing things, the word plus something, right? And a lot of the pluses is uh, trusting the, the scribes, the scholars, and the churches and adding what they have to say to the word of God and not just trusting the word of God itself. And they start going after what they think is the egg. Let's just put some little things here. And they're trying to be born again by these things. You know, like the church tells them, oh, to be born again, you need to be water baptized. So they think, oh yeah, I'm born again. I, I've been water baptized. Or, oh, I got to prove I'm saved by keeping the seventh day Sabbath. And, you know, all these things, they're falling off by the wayside, never actually being born again. And not only that, we see another metaphor where we are actually worms in the sight of God. As God calls Jacob that worm, and Jesus quotes a psalm when he says, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He's quoting a psalm where it talks about Jesus becoming a worm because, as Jesus said about Moses lifting up the serpent, which is a worm-like creature, up, he's going to be lifted up in the same manner. And he becomes sin. And we, what are we? We are sin. We're mixed with it. So we're all these worms trying to get life. He's drawing us to him. And all these worms go off to the side and they perish. And it's a depiction of how hell is, where all these people that end up coming to the actual egg, they become born again. And all of the ones that are drawn to the egg, even if they don't actually get into the egg, are going to be used for the child. While the ones off to the side are going to be absorbed by the woman. Right? So there's a, a separation, you can say, of the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats kind of thing. And these ones will get life. They've come to the cross. These ones did not. Right? And these ones are going to be made whole, as in made into the image and likeness of God now. Right? And these ones are going to be made into the image of their father. So they're going to be that worm. And that's what's going to end up happening in hell is there's a constant, constant degradation. Right? Where uh, the serpent's punishment because it got Eve to sin, it deceived her, that he's no longer going to walk. Apparently, the serpent was able to walk around, had legs or wings or something. And ever since it did that, it now crawls on its belly, became a worm. It's uh, in a, uh, I don't want to say humbled state because the, 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 the serpent didn't humble itself, but it's in a inferior position, a humiliated position, I guess I would say. And that's what's going to happen to man. We are not actually in the image and likeness of God right now. We are in a fallen state of it because we don't have the spirit. And you, to, to receive the spirit, you need to be born again. Then you receive the spirit of God. You are made whole. You're made a new creature. And what's another thing that's interesting is that all these represent the Christians that come to the cross. 
when they come to the egg, the sperm dies, and there is a intimacy. Like I made a video about the intimacy has to do with knowing God and God knowing you. And this is how you're saved, by that deep intimacy with God. As there's many people who call in Jesus, Lord, Lord, doing many th wonderful works in his name, casting out devils in his name, prophesying in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you because this event never happened. You know, a lot of these people off to the side, they may be doing that. They're preaching what they think is Christianity. And there might be little bits of truth to that, but there's also a bunch of garbage mixed with it. And they're going off following false eggs, right? A false new birth. But this, at this deep intimacy here, the the DNA of the man is split and given to the woman, and the woman's DNA is split and given to the man's uh, seed there. So you see that there's that deep intimate connection where here man goes to the cross, into the egg, he dies, and then you are split and joined with God. We become one flesh with him, and as the child is in the womb, it is one flesh with the mother, right? They're as if they're one body, a body within a body, and the woman is an, a perfect example of the Christian. How we are actually right now is like, in a sense, a pregnant woman as we receive the seed of God through his word, like we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through 25, about how we are born again by the word of God, and that word of God is the gospel that is preached on to us. And the gospel is how Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. And like the woman who is pregnant, she has another body within her. She has another entity within her that's partly her and partly someone else. We are in that same way we, where there's something within us, a new creature within us that battles against this old creature. As Paul talks about in Revel, uh, not Revelation, Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 24, uh, we have this vile body and it gets us to do the things we don't want to do and keeps us from doing the things we want to do. But it's that sin that dwells in us. But this new creature that we are fights against that. And we are uh, within us. It's partly us and it's partly God. Because we've accepted the word of God within our heart, and that is like the sperm entering the egg. There's that new birth. There's a new creature within you that is fed, as Peter goes on to say in the second chapter of his first epistle, uh, verse 2 of chapter 2, about now that you're newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word. Another connection to not just the word of God, but a deep intimacy with God, where you're sucking off his breast to to live, to survive, to grow. It's that another deep connection there. And again, we have that within us, this new being that is partly us and partly God. Right? Just like the woman that has a child with him that is partly her and partly of the man. So we really meditate on these things. We think about these things. These things become more clear. And we see how deep the intimacy is with God. Like we read in Genesis 4, very first couple of verses there, talks about how Adam knew Eve and she conceived. So you see how God has to know you for you to conceive to be born again. And that's a verse of eternal security there. Because when Jesus says, I never knew you, how can he tell someone who has been born again and sealed with his spirit that he never knew them? You are known of God. Right? Like we read in Galatians chapter 4, where he talks about how, hey, you are 
you know God, or rather are known of God, why do you turn now to the weak and beggarly elements of the world? And you can say that with these, let's say these fellows here, they come here, they're being born again, but they want to follow the group, right? They also want to be with like the group. This is the weak and beggarly elements, like these legalists and ritualists and these people that are all about them while claiming it's about loving God and loving their fellow man, but it's not. It's all about self-exaltation, saying I can be like God, or I can keep the law and stop sinning. I can do all the rituals perfectly, and I can do all the good works and save myself, where when I'm judged, God's going to be very pleased with me. He's going to save me because I'm good. But they just seem to have missed the other equation here, where it's not just about doing that. That's where you're containing yourself. You're cleaning the outside of the cup. The inside needs to be clean, as in you need to be born again, a new creature. They completely ignore that or are oblivious to it. That's the key, is the, the whole born again. Uh, so, as you see over here, uh, I put a depiction of the male to be the opposite over here. Like we have the positive charge over here, negative charge. So there's the attraction, right? God attracts us. He draws us. But you see, you can also flip this. Where now I'm going to put a depiction where God is the male here. And I put the do to be to represent, obviously, the two balls. You know, I don't want to draw pictures for you. And deal with all the complaints here people uh, lack of maturity i know this is a bit of the meat of the word and i should have put that in before i started doing this video but i forgot but anyway uh, i put the an o and n here for old and new testament the word of god and the word of god comes to you and you are the egg just a spot right and uh basically something dead right it's just something that eventually is going to corrupt and end up causing uh menstruation right it, it, it dies and bleeds out right but here god gives life the word of god is life and it's the light of men like we read in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. So you receive the word and the word of God abides in you, in your heart. And then you are now born again. And the child, let's just put a C here. Child starts to grow. So we see through this connection here of how... All of this actually fits here because if we put ourselves on the other side, like being on the side of the woman here, which is pretty much where we're at, we also see a different analogy of what's going on here, where the word that we actually attract is the word that we can actually comprehend and understand, and it humbles us and puts us in our place. And we can accept it so that we can be born again. And this is the rest of the word of God that we're just like, what is this? And it ends up becoming nutrients for us where we might not be able to accept it and understand it. But eventually, since we've received it, it becomes part of us. And eventually, we understand it. Right? So... Uh, with all that being said, uh, that is that, that is, that is life. And there was one last thing I wanted to say is that when you're preaching the gospel, uh, I, I, there's another analogy here because we see Philip on his, on the road to Damascus. He's not preaching to everybody, 
But there is somebody who is actually reading the scriptures and trying to understand them. So the way you can see that is that Philip is, let's draw a little one here. He's already here. He's born again. And these people are being drawn, but they're kind of going off to the side, right? This is the eunuch. He's kind of going off. And God tells him, hey, go to him. Tell him. And then he draws him over here so that he can be born again. You know, but he is not going to go over to these ones that are just going off doing their own thing. These are the other people on the road to Damascus. It's only the ones that God's drawing. He's like, hey, help him out a little bit. Right? And I know there's people who would say, well, Jesus sent them out two by two to go out. It's like, yeah, he did. In Israel. Told him to go out and preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not to the Samaritans, not to the Gentiles. That wasn't something that was really done until Jesus rose from the dead and the Holy Spirit was given. Then they went out to the world. But it was really after a period of time where they kept preaching to the Jews and they still rejected it. They didn't repent of what they did to Jesus. So. Then it went out to the world, right? So at times it's the ones that God's drawing. At the time that Jesus was there, he's drawing Israel, not the world. So he's reaching them. And if they ended up going, oh, you know what? I'm rejecting it completely. Well, then he starts drawing other ones, right? He puts out that signal that repels where there's blindness in part upon Israel. So let's just put a kind of a square shape where there's a blindness on them. And then he lifts the blindness off of whoever of these people want to come and start getting drawn over here. Whoever will pay attention, he starts drawing them. Right? So uh, the point being there is that I know you may want to reach people and you may be trying to reach people and not been successful. But you got to realize a few things. Sometimes God's not drawing them or they're not responding to God drawing them. So let the blind follow the blind and leave them alone. Right? That's what Jesus says of these, these pharisaical people like the, a good chunk of Christianity. Uh, namely Catholicism, you know, you want to reach out to them, and I'm not saying not to, but, you know, if you're getting stressed out and just worn out from the whole thing, pull back, because it it's not on you to save everybody, and you can't force people to believe and to be saved, it, you just can't, you can, I used to think it was me, and I would have to explain things differently, to do it more clearly, to break it down better. Maybe, you know, they just don't understand what I'm saying or what have you and simplify it more or present it in a different way. It's like, that's that's not what it is. It's them and their heart and their relationship with God is not there where they're not following God's leading, where God has given them pieces of truth and they've rejected it. So their heart has become hardened. So no ma amount of reasoning and arguing and debating and all this stuff is actually going to get through to them. It's only thing that's going to get through to them is potentially prayer. And I say potentially because the spirit of God can reach them. But they can resist that spirit. So it's not a guarantee just because you pray for them 24-7 that it's going to happen. God's going to get to them, but they still have the free will to reject them. So when it comes to actually reaching people, it's more of just keeping your eyes open to see who's actually being drawn. Not so much trying to get through to everybody. So, you know, don't try to carry that burden of saving the whole world upon yourself. So anyway, now with that being said, thanks for watching and take care. 
All right, real quick. I forgot to add this in there where I was thinking this at that this analogy is probably why we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 about how bishops have to be married with children. And that reasoning is because bishops are overseers. But though bishops are physically men and they have their wives and their children and they're acting as the role as a man in the in the place of God where we're told in the scriptures that Christ is the head of man and man is the head of the the woman. But that also tells us that as the woman's role to us as a man, we have that same role as a woman to God. So the bishop will be able to experience that with his life so that when he is in the church, he understands that his role over the church is as the bride, the wife, the woman to the children where he is to give them the milk of the word, right? And what do we see today with that, actually? We see, oh, that there was a formula shortage and everybody was in, oh, well, how are we going to feed our children? And I was just thinking, do you all have like some kind of breast cancer? You, you're all not producing milk yourself? How come... For thousands of years, we never needed baby formula, but all of a sudden, without the baby formula, babies are going to die. It just didn't make sense. It's like, that's what they live off of. And it's, again, showing how the world is. It's another metaphor where we ought to be having the, the straight word of God and that deep intimacy with God. That, that Like a child has that deep intimacy with the mother and the bonding by receiving the milk from her. And that milk actually strengthens the child's immune system and does many wonders that we don't realize that baby formula does not do. Baby formula is artificial, and the child may be sustained by that. Yes, but it's as if getting the corrupted word of God. You get some truth, but not all the truth. And you get a lot of the lies as well. And you get all of these false doctrines and you get all these people led astray. Right? So I just wanted to add that in there, how that's why the bishops are required to have that family structure. Because Paul tells generally the Christians to be like he is. And if they're able, not that they have to be, but if they're able to be celibate and not married. And to just dedicate their life to God. But if they marry, they're not sinning. But he's saying if you want to be a bishop, well, then you have to have a family unit. And that is why. So that you can look at your wife and how she is with her children to understand how you got to be to your husband, who is Jesus, with the church. Right? That the ultimate authority is not you. It is God. You're there to take care of the children, to raise them up, and to teach them how to respect God, to respect Jesus. Because they see how you act with him and how you treat him, how you treat his word, and they'll do the same thing. Just like when you're in a family, how your wife, the mother of your children, treats you is the same way your children are going to treat you. Right? So that's why these things are required. So anyway, now, thanks for watching. Thanks again. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. Amen. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Just like that. You have been saved? Yeah. 
If you ever saved, you were saved like that. 